Hello, and welcome to Global Supply Chain Week. This is the Ocean Freight Maritime Edition, and I'm your host, Steve Ferreira, that will be walking, through, walking you through this exciting session. I'm CEO of Ocean Audit, a global refund audit consultancy in Hartford, Connecticut, and host of Navigate B2B on gracing these Freightwave TV airways. It's pleased to be a, I'm pleased to be a host today for a really exciting segment on ocean freight and the, and the global or um, COVID supply chain 2021. And with me today to help narrate the story is a good close friend and president of John Monroe Consulting and representative of Worldwide Logistics here in North America, John Monroe. John, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's always uh, a pleasure to be on your show. Wow, that's, you know, I got to tell the audience, I mean, I reflect back on our careers. We started out 35 years ago. <laughs> we we both worked in Oakland, California at US Lines. And, you know, back then, um, dress and uh, uh, style and success and training and role playing. We learn from the best in the business. And I think that's one of the reasons, John, you know, you certainly have shined and you've you've always accentuated the training that you receive from US lines. And I don't think I would be sitting here either if I hadn't had that. So um, I guess from two ex US liners to where we are today, God, that's a lot of ground and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of, um, you know, heartbreak and markets and changing conditions that we've experienced, isn't it? I think it was the intensity, Steve. I mean, when you go through that kind of intensity, there's a certain bonding, but also a very quick uh, learning curve. So, well, we had some great mentors and uh, there were some great sales trainers along the way and uh, the information flow, as you know, you and I have both been in the ocean business now for some three and a half plus decades. And so it's really interesting. I didn't even think about this going on to our show today. Our, our stage talk, um, fireside chat, whatever you'd call it. But um, yeah, between the two of us, geez, we've got about 70 years, 75 years in uh, in maritime. And um, so I hope that, uh, and I know that our audience is gonna have some great takeaways from the session. So John, I am so pleased that you have been um, gracious enough to uh, help us make some sense and semblance of this uh, you know, really interesting market. By the way, before we get started, um, John lives part time or sometimes of the year in, in Shanghai with his uh, beautiful wife and and uh, young son. And I just want to say happy Lunar New Year, John, to you and your family. Thank you. And, and same to you, Steve. It's uh, uh, we're trying to get back there. But as you know, China's closed to uh, uh, non Chinese passport holders uh, for quite some time until COVID. So um, we're hoping to get back there as soon as they open it up. Well, it's a great segue, and I hope you know you do and your family do. It's one place that I want to hit and uh, expand uh, Ocean Audit's business. But I think that's a good segue that the uh, general public and, and the media, uh, especially the media outside uh, freight waves that, that are observing our session today, and the general trends on Chinese New Year that the public may not know about. You know, you um, and we'll talk about your incredibly impressive uh, newsletter that you keep the trade informed of at the end of the show. But I think one of the things I always learn from you, John, is uh, the back story and the back story on Chinese New Year. 300 million Chinese migrating uh, the trucking situation over there. I just think that, you know, we look at the U.S. and we think of ourselves as one side of all the equations, but there's another partner, obviously, China and, and Asia. Can you give the audience a, a brief backdrop on the importance of Chinese New Year and the stress or features and benefits it's putting on the supply chain over there right now? Well, if you can imagine the entire population of the U.S. as a migrant workers, um, you know, most, and, and this started when uh, China had the experiment down in Shenzhen and opened up Shenzhen as, uh, as a special bonded trade zone uh, with factories, and it succeeded, so they expanded it throughout China. So in order, you know, most people in China did not live in the cities. And I remember in 91, uh, when I was there with Circle, and you could see migrant workers uh, at the railways just sitting there, uh, hundreds if not thousands of them, They'd come from inland areas to uh, 
uh, uh, to look for jobs because all the jobs were in eastern China along the coastal ports. Um, uh, Cynthia and I, uh, my wife and I, we, we spent seven years going up and down the Yangtze River. And, and as a part of uh, what we wrote, Yangtze River World Report, we studied the migrant labor and, and the sources and origins of migrant labor. And I think on one of my updates, I posted a map which basically shows it comes from everywhere in China now. So this year, it's particularly a little bit troubling because it's um, and nobody's certain what's going to happen. Um, normally, what you have is you have about 290 to 300 million people moving by uh, 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 train, plane, and bus uh, to their hometown, which can be as close as uh, 30 kilometers to as far as away as several thousand kilometers away. And typically that takes time. And Chinese New Year's, of course, the Lunar New Year holiday is a week long. This year, it started early. Um, so uh, Shenzhen, of course, you know, they had special incentives to encourage people not to go home, and so did Beijing. Uh, but in other areas, um, particularly the truck drivers, uh, because a number of factories stayed open to continue producing, but uh, a good percentage of the truck drivers, they went home. And um, what that means this year is they had to leave early enough to quarantine for two weeks in their hometown. And when they come back, which is due to come back uh, somewhere around the 18th or 19th, they have two more weeks of quarantine. In the meantime, nobody can get a container delivered. And that is part of the issue right now is that uh, the terminals are open. Of course, there's a lot for the uh, carriers to clean up. So, you know, there was a 30 to 35 percent rollover uh, up to Chinese New Year and, of course, 40 to 50 percent in Southeast Asia. So so it's it's really been a struggle. And I, I think now uh, everybody's looking to see when uh, they're going to have a full complement of drivers back to be able to deliver uh, uh, deliver product back to the terminals. Yeah, do you think it's something almost akin to, um, I hate to make an analogy of the, uh, the calm or the eye, being in the eye of a storm. I mean, you know, the fact that um, there's so many moving parts to this equation, right? You could also say that this gives the ocean carriers operational capabilities to start, um, you know, cleaning up and, and vacuuming up um, congestion in the ports. But then again, there's also the human factor with COVID and, and uh, longshore and port issues, health related issues as well. And then you've got the whole issue, as you reported in your recent newsletter, of some 300,000 TEU still sitting off the port of LA and Long Beach because the, the vessels can't get unloaded. So let's just kind of do a reset. I mean, those are some facts that we know about. But how did I want to know, and our audience wants to know, so what are these factors that created this new COVID supply chain? I mean, we've talked about some of them, but could you synthesize them in general for the audience? Well, you really have to go back to April, May of last year when contracts were being negotiated by the carriers. And, and typically during that period, the, the carriers will have blank sailings. They'll initiate blank sailings in order to keep um, uh, rates high enough so that they can get uh, a compensatory rate on the contracts. This last year, you know, what happened, and I probably wouldn't have noticed it had I not been tracking this. I, I you know, when I, I came back from China in January 31st on the second to last flight from Shanghai to Seattle. And um, at that time, China had already been shutting down. So I was well aware of what was going on there. And my team at Worldwide, uh, specifically Cherry, who runs that, started, I, I'd asked her if she could provide information you know, to our network. And she began providing uh, information on when the factories were opening and closing, what was happening with the truckers, what was happening with factory capacity. And when COVID uh, came to the US, um, I took over that update and then I expanded it and who would have known it would have gone viral, but um, to start tracking what was going on. And, and it was that uh, uh, weekly tracking of what was going on that I, I could see that the carriers had had initiated their blank sailings, which everybody expected, but they kept them initiated probably about four to five weeks too long. It, it was really like a slingshot effect. Uh, uh, what happened was, is they had those blank sailings ratcheted down and it created a backlog in China. And then about mid to end of June, uh, 
you know, particularly for LA Long Beach, they sent 18 extra loaders. And an extra loader, for those that don't understand, is just a vessel that's not normally in the port rotation. So it, it's like adding a, another string or uh, a few vessels. And so all of a sudden you had the equivalent of about a 150 to 180,000 TUs uh, of extra cargo that now was slamming the ports of LA Long Beach. And that time, uh, people panicked. Uh, everybody realized, my God, I need chassis. So truckers were uh, uh, sucking up the chassis and hoarding them. They would pay the extra, extra per diems, whatever they had to pay, and they would just turn those chassis without turning them back in. So you begin to have the problem in LA Long Beach. And then of course, as the year went on uh, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year, it started moving north to Oakland and um, uh, uh, to the East Coast and to the inland uh, rail ramps. And of course, in the meantime, you know, the rates went up four or five fold over the contract rates. And you've got what, I, I hate the word, but I have to use it, a perfect storm, so. John, you know, it's uh, really fascinating to hear you describe that as we start to analyze, you know, what's caused the, uh, the the new norm. And again, I hate that word as well. But I think that, you know, when you look at why this COVID supply chain might be different than our seasonal import supply chain, you know, at this time of the year, you've raised some really good, good points. And I think that some of the points that you've raised today and that you've put together in your fabulous new newsletter is that, I can't ever remember a time, you know, where we monitored uh, factory capacity in China or, you know, um, you know, empties in, in Ningbo or, you know, all these micro factors. And so I'll just ask you the question directly. Could you explain to the audience how this COVID supply chain is different? And maybe you could cite some salient examples than our normal global, uh, our normal seasonal import supply chain. Sure. Well, well, I, I think when we shut down and, you know, when I came back from China, I could see how China shut down. We as a country, we're, we're it's a very different, uh, you know, we're a very different type of society. So so we tried to shut down. Um, uh, and of course, people aren't comfortable being cooped up or locked up. But the, the key thing there was, uh, uh, I think it's there about March. Um, when we deemed uh, we made a distinction between essential and non-essential companies and of course that picked the winners and losers in the retail segment um, and it also impacted the malls um, all of a sudden you have people shifting their buying patterns to online um, you know for quite some time nobody was wearing masks um, and and then some people were but what happened is is all of a sudden we had this uh, rush of, of cargo that nobody expected. The, the, uh, as we got up and running, all of a sudden we have a flood of PPEs. Um, we also had people shifting from, um, you know, everybody was concerned about going into stores. So they're, they're moving online. And, and, and I, I think I heard one uh, retail executive say it pushed forward uh, the online growth, the, the growth of e-commerce or online shopping five years. So all of a sudden, uh, I, I just looked at the statistics. Uh, we were up 44% this year in online versus brick and mortar retail uh, from the consumer. So you can. Yeah, and by the way, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to interrupt you. But the the thing that I was going to point out is that that is actually, I, I believe, U.S. Commerce Department statistics that you you. I, I saw that, and I was yeah. I was I have that on my my threat board because I wanted to talk to you. The chart looks like this, right? Yeah. it's crazy. Yes, it, it, it's. But I'm sorry. Please continue, John. It, it, it's out of proportion. So, you know, I guess you know companies like UPS and and and, and FedEx are cleaning up. Um, you know, Target Stores has been cleaning up because they went to a one view inventory system some time ago, so they can deliver from stores or or fulfillment centers or warehouses. And so it's changed the way we live and think about things. Um, think home appliances. Um, at home goods, uh, it's all going through the roof. Uh, I don't think people selling luggage are doing too well right now because nobody's traveling. But it's it's shifted the type of commodity. It's shifted the type of uh, of lifestyle we have, and it's shifted the the type of consumer spending. John, so you know you're same, so close. To... Go ahead. I'm I was sorry. just going to say at the same time, we have this pandemic, we have the shift of spending, 
And it's, it's what I like to say that's impacted the container shipping industry. So we now have a container pandemic as well as a COVID pandemic. Totally appreciate that. You know, I was about to uh, mention as well. So, you know, I think you and I are so, so much uh, people persons that we really like to get down to know the pulse of what's happening with our brothers and sisters in logistics and supply chain. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, you talked about as we look at this seasonal supply chain, that's different is I think it's the F word, right? And I don't mean that word, but I mean forecasting. I think that you brought up a good point where order management, you know, taking all the orders and, 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 and migrating them to the factory level, because I think what's happened in the past is a lot of BCOs, beneficial cargo owners have said, oh, you know, geez, our, our products four weeks late and they blamed, you know, carrier XYZ, where really it was a deficiency on materials in the factory, but they didn't have that visibility. Maybe you can speak about how forecasting is maybe the wild card for this season, if you believe that to be the case. Absolutely, Steve. Um, you know, in the fourth quarter, what really happened is many of the CEOs and CFOs couldn't believe their logistics management team. They woke up to the fact that, you know, their product was four to six weeks late and they were paying five times the cost. So it's, it, it's, it's really sort of upended everybody's idea of how they're going to look at planning for 2021. And, and a big part of that is, you know, how can I forecast? Um, I created a chart on one of my updates that basically said, if you're moving to the West Coast, uh, you need to add four weeks, uh, possibly five weeks, so that you can get it to your client on time. But we've experienced a lot of things that we didn't expect. Uh, Containers sitting on the terminal in LA Long Beach for four weeks before it gets on a rail. Um, there was a train sitting sidetracked on the way to Minneapolis and it was there for four to five weeks because of lack of chassis in, in Minneapolis. Uh, the same thing happened uh, on, on one of the uh, ramps in Chicago. So, so we truly experienced a kind of gridlock to where everybody's looking for alternate ports. Um, uh, everybody, some people have started sending more to the East Coast, uh, Houston, uh, wherever they could get into. I, I think in this update, I said, you know, start looking at Charleston because they don't have chassis problems and they don't have uh, uh, problems uh, with velocity through the terminal. So you just have to rethink um, what you've been doing. So I, I think I get what you're saying. And, and that uh, that's actually a really interesting working man's viewpoint of, of how logistics men and women in our supply chain can start helping their entire company refocusing on, for example, looking at Mobile or Charleston or, you know, getting the intel on where the chassis are. And it's all about, you know, the conversations that they have with their providers. Um, we're coming into the segment where I kind of like to throw out uh, uh, something I'll call John's tru truisms. And it's just your 30 second take on a couple okay. of really important points. Let's take a bet. How long is this going to be sustainable in terms of we're going to see this kind of container get? I'm going to say all of 2021. Your turn. I, I will tell you that what, what, what I told somebody, uh, uh, Wendy at the Port of Long Beach, I was talking to her and saying they, they, they had a, a running bet as to when this would end. And I threw out my date. My date is March 2022. So. I, I have no win a chicken dinner. That. That's my thought on it. John, you know, you and I think exactly simpatico on that. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I shouldn't say I pity the experts that think it's going to end, you know, in, in April or May. I, I totally agree with you that we're in the calm before the storm. We're going to see another container get and we're going to get another Biden stimulus. And and um, I guess the last question I want to ask you is that in 30 seconds or less, what can we expect as the new norm going forward? I, I think the new norm is going to center around e-commerce and, and it could flatten out the seasonalities that we have uh, and raise the bar in terms of volumes. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, because under the e-commerce model, you're, you're, you're placing orders every day. And, and I think that's where we're going to end up. And it's too early to tell, but it could be the volumes we're, we're experiencing now are is the baseline that we go into 2022. And if that's the case, given that every vessel that's available, including ones that were set for scrapping, are uh, being utilized today, uh, that's going to present its own set of problems. 
Well, that's really interesting. And uh, last but not least, give give us a 30 second uh, viewpoint on just uh, what are the three, give me th three one word or three two word answers on what should BCOs be doing right now? Number one. Um, contracts. Uh, two. The sanctity of the contract. Um, uh, forecasting. Three. Um, uh, rethinking uh, your your situation with your suppliers to make sure they're on board on everything you're doing. Wow. You know, I love the way that you've taken the big picture and then you've brought down to three immediate things that our audience can do. And I can't thank you enough. You've been watching a fireside chat with my good, good friend, John Monroe, president of John Monroe Consulting and North America rep for Worldwide Logistics. John, how can people reach out to you? Uh, they can reach out to me, uh, John at johnmonroe.com, no H, or uh, I'm, I post on LinkedIn probably three times a day. And I have a new site, cargobutlers.com, but it's not completely up yet. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that. And so from the Global Maritime Conference, I'm your host of today's session, Steve Ferreira. We'll see you on the next session. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye, John. You. Bye.